Come on. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Great. Oh, that's good. That's good. Well, I'm really, really happy uh, to to be here. Um, as Linda said, I'm the president and CEO of the Black AIDS uh, Institute, uh, and my running joke is um, that. Um, as a person who's been living with HIV now for 30 years, uh, I'm happy to be anywhere. You know? <laughs> so, but, um, you know, <laughs> I, 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 my friend Shirley Ralph says every day above ground uh, is a good day. And so today is a good day. Uh, this is the, the third time I've been invited to spend time uh, with you, and I want to thank uh, NABJ uh, for. Uh, uh, thinking that I still have something uh, to say, but as someone once said, everything's worth saying has already been said, but apparently no one was listening, so it's worth <laughs> repeating. Uh, two years ago, when I was here, I said uh, that AIDS in America today is a black disease. Uh, last year, uh, in this very room, I started my talk by saying AIDS in America today is a black disease, uh, and guess what? Uh, AIDS in America today is a blacker disease. Uh, and, uh, and while I understand how you know, that might be a difficult story to, to, to tell you know, in 2011 and 2012, if it appears it is the same story, I would argue that, quite frankly, uh, that is one of the stories. <laughs> You know, the fact that, you know, while we are certainly making progress, and I'll talk about some of that, we're not making enough progress, particularly in black communities. And the progress that we are making is not happening evenly across uh, communities. You know, already uh, we've talked a little about the data, uh, and some of that, you know, is really worth repeating. You know, uh, in a year where the census is one conversation, and we're measuring the size of black America in the, in the context of all of America, uh, it, sh it is kind of chilling you know, that when we are you know, 10 or to 12 percent of, of the population and we're over 50 percent of the new cases, uh, we're 50 percent of people living with HIV and AIDS, we're 50 percent of the annual uh, AIDS-related deaths, and when you drill down uh, that data becomes even more alarming. Now, among men who have sex with men, you know, we're talking about 30% of the new cases. Among men in general, you know, 40% of them are black. You know. Among women, two-thirds of the new cases are black. And among young people, that youngest population, uh, that we're talking about you know, 70% of the new HIV AIDS cases among young people are our kids. You know, uh, and, and these are important stories. You know, uh, Essex Hemphill said, I want to start an organization to save my life. If whales, snails, Chrysler, and Nixon can be saved, uh, then the lives <laughs> of black people, we just dated Essex, but the lives of black people uh, are valuable and must be saved. We should be able to save ourselves. I don't want to wake up one day uh, and read a report by the Heritage Foundation that says black people are extinct. No. Mm. Uh, and so this is kind of the lens and the context uh, in which I think we need to base our stories. I think that the conclusion uh, from the last speaker is really important, that there's four things in the context of HIV. Now, one is that HIV is completely preventable. Uh, and so what's happening? No. And, and yes, no, HIV rates have been stable over the last decade or so, but in our community, stable at a too high of a rate. You know, uh, and so what can we do to drive that down? HIV is completely diagnosable. Uh, and so what is the story about, treat about testing? You know, and, and, and what is preventing us from getting, getting tested? Uh, and also, as a part of that, you know, the truth of the matter is that we are getting tested. The problem is that we're not getting tested early enough. And then we're not being linked to care. That's the third thing. For many people, HIV is also treatable. Uh, and I'm a living example of that. You know, I'm alive today in part because I have access uh, to care and treatment and a good doctor. Um, also in part because I have the love and support of family and friends, and that speaks to the stigma today. Now, so it is preventable, it is diagnosable, uh, it is treatable. Now, um, 
And so in that environment, you know, we should be able to make greater progress. So um, this is 30 years of the AIDS epidemic. We are at a deciding moment. Um, you no, know, every day in ways both large and small, each of us has a deciding moment. Uh, we decide you know, to get tested or not. Uh, we decide to protect ourselves or our partners or not. Mm -hmm. now, we decide uh, to seek treatment or not. Now, and the reasons and the motivators in which we make those decisions or not are important stories that you can tell in the context you know, of your publications. I think that NABJ plays a critical role now because, and you play a critical role, in that many of you sit in rooms day in and day out where you are either one of a few, if not the only person in the room that looks like me. And I need you to fight for that story. Now, and I know that a lot of the decision makers are over this story, you know, and, and, and I get the, the whole notion of if it bleeds, it bleeds. I understand that. But it's important that you make sure that whoever is making the decisions understand that this is a story, if that's the context in which they need to understand it, this is a story where people are bleeding. Mm. You know? And when you talk about the impact that HIV is having you know, in our communities, that's exactly what's going on. So what are some of the contextual issues that are important around HIV today? And I'm going to read off some of them from a story perspective. I'm not going to go deep into data and what have you, but just try to focus on what are the story angles. Um, uh, chief among them is health care reform. Now, it's important that we understand that health care reform is an aid story. Now, when you talk about eliminating pre-existing conditions, that's critical for people who are living with HIV and and folks who are most at risk for HIV. Uh, when you talk about removing lifetime caps and annual caps, you know, that's critical in an HIV environment. HIV you know, is a very expensive disease to have. Uh, the treatments are expensive. You know, the fact that HIV attacks your immune system, uh, that makes you vulnerable to other chronic diseases, you know, that we see elevated levels of diabetes and heart disease and cancers, now, and liver disease, now, and kidney disease among people who are living with HIV. All of those issues are important around the issue around CAPS. When you talk about children being able to stay on their parents' insurance up until 26, and you see the rising caseloads of HIV in uh, young, younger people, health care reform is an important HIV story. When you talk about filling the donut, you know, one of the biggest expenses for people living with HIV is the cost of prescription medications. Now, and so the donut story is an HIV a story. Now, two days ago was the first, the, year, the first year anniversary of the signing of the Affordability Care uh, Act. Uh, and, um, and I think that stories around that, on what's happening around the country, and there are stories around the country where, you know, health care reform is not something that's going to happen in 2014. For black folks, you know, it started on day one. No, that, that there are areas in which we desperately needed to, to, to have access that started a year ago, and, and they're happening as we roll along. The second thing is National HIV AIDS Strategy. Now, for the first time in the history of the epidemic, last year, uh, the United States released a National HIV AIDS Strategy. Now, when we give money to other countries, we demand that they have a National AIDS Strategy, but we have not had one until last year. Now, and as my grandmother used to say, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Now, no, the rubber meets the road, and there's some important issues that we need to think about relative to the National HIV AIDS Strategy and relative to health care reform. You know, show me the money, Jerry, show me the money. You know, and so the question is, you know, are we going to appropriate to make sure there are resources available for health care reform? How serious is the threat of health care reform? Uh, to health care reform to us, and we need to make sure what are the implications that happen in our communities if health care reform is repealed. And with regard to the National AIDS Strategy, what we're concerned about now is the impl impl implementation of the National AIDS Strategy. How are we going to make sure, how does the National AIDS Strategy impact black people specifically? Good news is that the president has explicitly called out populations most at risk. 
Now, that includes explicitly talking about black and Latino communities, uh, explicitly talking about you know, the AIDS epidemic among men who have sex with men, explicitly talking about folks who live in the Northeast and the Southeast. You know, uh, these are all themes that are critically important around following the data. And, and from my lens, and as you might expect, I think all of those priority areas are about, are about black people. Obviously, when he explicitly talks about black and Latino people, he's talking about us, and that's important. Uh, but when we talk about men who have sex with men, now, the largest driver of the AIDS epidemic among men who have sex with men is the AIDS epidemic among black men. Mm -hmm. Now, and so that's a conversation about us. When he talks about the Northeast and, and, and the Southeast, you know, the Zion region of the world, that is about us because the vast majority of us live east of the Mississippi. The, the largest concentrations of black folks in America is in the Southeast. Now, so that lens is about us uh, as well. So the National AIDS Strategy, you can go to the, the, to the www.aids.gov and you'll find the National AIDS Strategy. Now there are implementation plans that are out. There's even operational plans that are out. But the story, I think, for you are what are, what are communities doing around implementing the National HIV AIDS Strategy? There is a ECHIP e project going on but from the CDC, and there's a 12-city initiative where 12 cities that are most impacted about, uh, by HIV and AIDS uh, are being called upon to draw up uh, AIDS local AIDS strategies. That's an important story because when you look at those 12 cities, there are also cities where there are high incidences in black communities. The next story, the biomedical interventions. You know, uh, there are you know, new prevention strategies, new prevention technologies that are critically important. PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, the opportunity or the possibility uh, that for folks most at risk, that they in fact can take, they in fact might be able to take a pill once a day that can provide some form of protection against HIV. Again, the question is implementation. The devil is always in the details. What does that mean? How will it work? Now, we have one study right now that was that has very, very promising results among men who have sex with men. But that's one study in one specific population. We need to find out how does this work in the context of women. Now, we need to find out what are the, 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 the uh, financing implications to this strategy. Who, is the, who are the likely candidates? Now, what are the important issues around adherence? There's PEP. Now, post-exposure prophylaxis historically has been primarily used in medical settings, but we're talking about it in the context of sexual encounters as well. What's the relationship between PrEP and PEP? You know, and, and how does this work on the streets? We know how it works in the context of a clinical trial, but how does it work on the streets in everyday uses? Microbicides, both vaginal and rectal microbicides. The ability of vaginal rectal microbicides are critically important because it allow women, allows women to protect themselves. Uh, and taking, having the ability and being empowered to protect yourself is critically important. But rectal microbicides for men who have sex with men and for heterosexual couples who engage in re re rectal anal intercourse. Uh, so, so exploring uh, rectal microbicides. Condoms. Uh, now, while that's not a new technology, uh, you know, how do we better, how do we have better utilization of condoms? Uh, treatment as prevention, we know now, and, and it's quite logical, that uh, if we can do a better job of getting people who are HIV positive on treatment, we drive down the viral load. And how does treating people who are HIV positive, how is that a prevention strategy? I think that's an extremely compelling story, and it gets people who are living with HIV into the prevention conversation. Uh, 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 testing and linkages to care. Now, now that we have rapid testing, um, it is important that we do a better job of linking people into care. A test is not a cure. Test is not treatment. And so testing people and just testing people and letting them go away is not good enough. So we need testing and linkages to care. I'm running out of time, so I'll run through just a few high-level topics uh, and maybe we'll have time for questions afterwards. The new Congress. 
You know, people are talking about the Tea Party and the influence of the Tea Party. But what's important to understand are two things. Well, there are lots of things important to understand, but very, very quickly. That the vast majority of the freshman class of the new Congress are not Tea Party members. Some of them are. The vast majority of them are, are traditional conservative Republicans who've come to Washington on, on, on a promise of reducing the deficit and cutting the budget. You know, uh, and not raising taxes or cutting taxes. And so what does that mean to health programming? What does it mean to health care reform? What does it mean to the national aid strategy? What does it mean to the ADAP waiting list? You know, what does it mean to program that, 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 that are critically important in poor communities? The International uh, AIDS Conference is coming to the United States in 2012. Uh, the world will have its focus on the AIDS epidemic uh, in the United States. Uh, and this year and next year, there are many, many stories uh, about that. Uh, and then finally, I would just say, at the end of the day, um, it is about the people and it's about what folks are doing. And as you craft these stories, it's important that we don't craft them with a new pathology around black people or continue the pathology around black people. You know? And the truth of the matter is you have to speak to the lie that the AIDS epidemic is happening in our communities because we are not getting the message that we're not changing our behavior. In fact, there have been dramatic changes in behaviors in black communities, and that's an important story, but the changes are not enough. And one of the reasons why they're not enough is because we are fighting a bigger epidemic in our communities and because there are all these structural barriers. 